Hi, in this video I will be talking about the short text by Kahneman. And the idea is, again, still to use the sort of Kuhnian perspective of trying to make sense of science, how arguments evolve, and how, how different researchers can look at, at the same field, the same data sets, the same studies, and disagree substantially. Um, so again, just to try to use an example to exemplify what Kuhn was talking about. So, um, the, 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 the issue in, in question here is about something called power posing. A social psychologist called Amy Cuddy has become famous on talking about power posing, and I'm going to show a video in just a second where she sh sh talks about what, what this actually is. The idea is that standing in a certain posture of confidence, a bit like Wonder Woman stands in, 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 sort of in, in the front of, of her movies, is that if you stand in a post of confident, then even if you actually didn't feel confident before, it can affect the testosterone and cortisol levels in, in your brain and body, and then sort of in that sense sort of make you feel confident. So the same way that forcing a smile could make someone feel happier, forcing confidence could make someone feel more confident. Fortunately, this doesn't really seem to, to work out, but I think it's an interesting example to take. Amy Cuddy's work here is still the second most watched TED Talk ever. At least last time I checked here in the, in the fall, um, it's, it's something that's received a lot of attention. Um, I'm just going to show a very short video highlighting the essence of what she's talking about. In our studies, if people stand like Wonder Woman for two minutes, uh, their testosterone increases significantly, their cortisol drops significantly, they are more risk-taking. Uh, in other people's studies, we find that they, their pain threshold is higher, they think more abstractly, and they are more likely to do well in very stressful situations like interviewing for a job. So, as she could hear her talk about, standing like Wonder Woman, as she also did, influences how many risks one is willing to take, it influences the hormone level, it influences your ability to do job interviews, influences your confidence. You can force feelings, you can force hormones, you can force performance simply by sort of taking a stance of confidence. And she did this, the original study she did with, with uh, Kani, uh, who we then read a paper uh, from, I read a text from. But really have to emphasize that there have been many attempts to replicate power posing effects so to try to redo the effect try to sort of find out how it works and and most fail so here is just a long list i'm not going to go through it in detail but it's a long list of different studies that all try to um, investigate whether power posing has these effects it did not have an effect on risky behavior um, it did not have an effect on risky behavior it did not have an effect on on social sensitivity in an interview context. Um, um, and yeah, so it basically they tried various ways of measuring what an effect could be. As, as she talked about in the video, there were many different ways of, of potentially measuring a positive effect, but, but it just all seems to fail. And Connie then at some point, uh, she sort of, one could say took responsibility for this or sort of took the consequences of this by saying, I was wrong. I did this study in 2010, but it turns out that I'm wrong. So this is also just to illustrate, this is what scientific progress can look like. Very rational, very constructive, very fairly quick, um, where people can see a better data set is better and we should not have, have done what we did. So as she's saying here, as evidence has come in over the past two years, my views have updated. I do not believe that power pose effects are real. Um, and, and then she's talking about what they did originally, and they just were a little bit too sort of uh, fanciful with the statistical analysis. Um, and and here she, for instance, talks about that, that they had, what was it, um, 42 people in total, but they first ran 25 to see if there was a result, then 10, then 7, then 5. This is not really in line with the, with the actual deduct deductive approach where you have a plan, you collect data and you analyze it. Here you sort of continuously try to peek at data to see if you got lucky this time. 10, 15 years ago, this seemed to be an okay thing to do in psychology. It's only then recently that realized the, the problems of this. 
they thought that if you at any one point find a significant effect, then it's actually true. But it turns out that, that due to randomness, uh, you just need a reasonable sample size in order to be sure about the effect. Um, so they looked at risk taking, but the way they analyzed the data was simply not okay. And they even excluded some because they didn't follow directions, whatever that means. So they actually had 42 at some point, sorry, 47 at some point, reduced it to 42 because these didn't really follow directions and the data probably didn't match the expectation. So, um, and also she's talking about when risk taking was administered, when the risk taking task was administered, people were immediately told that they had won something. And, um, and this sort of winning feeling could then increase the hormone level, which then could influence the risks, um, uh, the risk measure. So basically, it was just poor science, poorly developed, poorly set up. Um, so, so this is, so, so as she's saying here, this might just simply be an effect of that some took a risk, and that's how they ended up having. Um, that's why they ended up having an increased testosterone level. It might not have been because of their body position. So she's criticizing her own study, as you can see in, in, quite, in quite detail, many different angles on, uh, on it that she thinks makes it not okay. Amy Cuddy was also a co-author of this paper and she hasn't changed her mind about it. So there are sort of differences in, 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 in how to see this data. They don't, I mean, they look at the same spreadsheet with numbers, but they take different, they have different takeaways. And also like this overview that Connie has here in the text, because as she says, it's not just that she doesn't have faith in the effects of power poses. She doesn't effect, think the effect is real. She doesn't study it anymore. She discourages others from studying it. She doesn't teach it. She doesn't talk about it. I mean, this is sort of paradigmatic issues about um, trying to make sure that others don't sort of continue to fall into the same trap of having the assumption that this actually works out. Um, and also just being very transparent and honest about this mistake. So she keeps this paper up on her website um, and she sort of acknowledging the basic statistical mistakes that she made back then. But there are other people in the field, someone called Fiske, who, who thinks all this trying to replicating former studies, that's just methodological terrorism and we really shouldn't be engaging in that. If someone found something, we should just trust it and say, well, that it's probably true. If others are trying to recreate it, they are just doing a, a wrong thing. But, but I mean, Kahneman has also admitted that he was wrong in, um, about several things in his book uh, that we read some chapters from. Um, so, so, I mean, this is just sort of illustrating how there are different takes on how and if and when researchers should acknowledge being wrong. So there are some various levels of stubbornness, different beliefs that people stick to, different values about how to do research, different thoughts on techniques, um, that, that that's being showcased here. So so I think Kuhn's framework and terminology is is is, is sort of in play here. I want to add a, one more comment on the way that Cuddy usually does her randomized control trial, and 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 maybe you can pause the video and just look at this picture here to see if you notice something. So the power pose is is could for instance be one of these positions. So asking people that are in the treatment of doing a power pose that they have to engage in one of these two submission positions, and then. The bottom two positions are then what a power pose is compared with. It's a little bit tricky to sort of spot what I'm going for here, but feel free to stop the video, reflect on it. Um, I'm gonna make the point in, in the next in the next slide. So as, as sort of highlighted by this researcher here, what they're doing is they that they don't compare power poses to normal poses. They usually compare power poses to what you could call a contractive pose. So this is not sort of a normal stand. There is no one who's just standing straight with arms down their side, and this is then what you could compare a power pose to. These are sort of contractive poses of people that are sort of um, sort of rolling themselves up and 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 certainly I mean, doing the opposite of showcasing power. So the point here is that, uh, <clears throat> and and then when you when you look at a, a study that came that Cuddy did and and, and sort of the the conclusions they're trying to draw, they usually compare to contractive. And if they're comparing it to a normal post, they actually don't find an effect. So again, it shows how doing randomized control trials can be tricky. You have to think about not just your treatment, but you also have to think about what you're comparing the treatment to. And in this case, you make it a little bit easy for yourself if you compare it to a contractive post, because then you don't know if the effect is due to the treatment 
through the control, which is also sort of a treatment. So maybe the effect is if you tell people to sort of really roll up into the chair and, and then hide themselves, maybe that actually has a negative effect. It's not the power pose that has the positive effect. So this is just, again, to sort of show another example of how, um, how we have disagreements in science and how these disagreements are handled by scientific communities. And it's not just about sort of looking rationally at a theory and whether it fits with the world. There are some paradigmatic assumptions going on about what techniques to use, um, um, how to analyze data, to what degree you should trust data that others have produced. Um, but I think in any case, we can say it certainly does not seem to be the case that power posing works for improving the, increasing the testosterone level in your body or making you more confident or more risky or better in job performance. It, it is just turned out to be flawed research for various reasons, but sort of in a normal science process, better studies came along and most have then accepted this and moved on. There are some that, that are still stubborn. Maybe they end up being right somehow, but, but that was sort of Kuhn's point here is that it's only blind stubbornness that can keep people from sort of accepting his arguments piles on. So some people are more rational, so to speak, others are sticking to their stubbornness uh, for, for various reasons. In the live session, I'll then be sort of talking more generally about, well, what, how can we ensure that science is progressing properly, that we have rational discussions, that we are not stubborn? How can we, what can we do to sort of uh, ensure that science is the great thing that we can trust? Because I'm, I think I might have sort of given the impression with Kuhn and some of these examples that there's a lot of stubbornness going around and who knows if a theory is true in the end after all, since we can't compare it to the world that it actually is, is there no objective truth, etc. But I'm going to give a much more optimistic note on all this using the Srunten text in, in the live session.